Welcome. Do you want to start having a better critical mindset? A mindset that allows you to solve problems from a mathematical perspective? If so, this is the video for you. Now, some of you may know who Terrence Tao is. He has a masterclass on the platform called Masterclass, and he is a mathematical rock star. He is a genius, and he has been that for a very long time. He has won a lot of awards. So if you want to know more about his achievements, feel free to research who he is. And for the purposes of this class, I'll call him T. Let's get started. Math is beautiful. And that's how this entire masterclass starts out. Terence's goal for the masterclass is not necessarily to give you some advanced class and make you some expert overnight in mathematics, but his goal is to show you, expose you to the beauty of mathematics and to help you understand how connected problem solving, analogies, connections, and patterns are. If you want this to help you in your daily life, this is the class for you. The fundamental idea that runs through every class or every subset of this class is that mathematics is not magic. Mathematical thinking is for everybody. Another thing that you will find as a recurring theme in this class is that it's okay to fail. Failing is how you learn to approach problems differently and find creative solutions. Now let's move into chapter two. The more you think about your surroundings, the clearer it becomes that everything is connected. Math is about more than just solving problems. It's gaining insight and finding connections and explanations. The deeper you dive into anything in your life, the more you will discover and the more you will learn. T starts to tell us how he grew up thinking that he wanted to be a storekeeper. And I can understand that because he was great at calculation. I mean, he was, he skipped about five grades. He was constantly in classes of people who were twice his age, constantly in mathematical sports, you know, the sports competitions were timed, it took sustained effort, it required stamina. So he thought, well, he's good at calculations, he should probably become a storekeeper. He also had a lot of mentors, and the first was his mother. So I wanna mention that I was impressed with how many childhood photos his mother, who was his mentor, had kept for him. I believe that clearly his parents saw that there's, there's something about this kid. Very intelligent, let's, let's document his growth. And mathematicians help us in our everyday life. There's mathematicians in the White House. There's mathematicians in NASA. There's mathematicians in cybersecurity. There's mathematicians in software engineering. There's mathematicians everywhere. So the problem was because he wasn't seeing a lot of mathematicians in media. And so he just thought, you know, except of course, you see the occasional mathematician or genius who's maybe a crazy genius. And that's typically the representation they had. So in conclusion, some life lessons from mathematics. T tells us how much he realized that everything is connected. And he learned that as he grew up learning math. It was much later in his career that he learned that all the many subjects from chemistry to bio, to, to bio biology, physics, uh, algebra, geometry, etc., are all parts of one big body of knowledge. And I love the analogy that he gave. He said that mathematics is like looking at a landscape of a mountain range. And that mountain range has a lot of mist. But what you can only see are peaks. You see the peak of algebra. You see the peak of number theory. Perhaps as you keep learning, the peak lowers, well, the mist lowers, and you begin to see valleys. You see a valley that connects algebra and geometry, physics and differential equations. And as the mist lowers even more, as you get further in your learning of mathematics, you begin to see the city. You begin to see the highways the roads, and that part requires years and years of training. Chapter three talks about demystifying mathematics. Now there's a perception that math is some sort of sorcery. You know, these people are wizards. You know, if you wanna solve a quadratic equation, you invoke the quadratic formula. It's like a spell book. But many people do not even know why these formulas work. And they just see it as a book of spells. In fact, Terence tells us that a lot of children are born with intuition in mathematics, that children are naturally good at math. They just get scared as time goes on. And he gave an example. He says that, well, children will teach each other that there's no largest number. And it usually happens in a game at a young age. And I have experienced this. I remember clearly 
when I was a little kid playing this game. Some will say, well, the largest number is 1,000. And another will say 1 million. Another will say, oh, 1 billion. But eventually they'll realize that you can simply counter whatever the other child said by adding plus one. And without knowing, the children have realized something that is known as a mathematical technique. It's known as proof by contradiction. People think that they are bad at math because it's usually taught in a prescriptive manner, which is unnatural. But math is a language and children naturally pick up language. So imagine if you, let's say you speak English, you didn't learn it by speaking and listening. You learned it by diagramming sentences and distinguishing nouns from adjectives, and that's all you learned. You might think that you're bad at English because schools overemphasize rigor, especially in mathematics. But math is good at clarifying and stripping problems down to its barest essentials. And it's a clear language for solving problems. This is a theme that recurs throughout this entire masterclass. The purpose of mathematics is to ultimately communicate ideas and concepts with precision. Even in your day-to-day -day life, stripping down any kind of problem to its bare essentials can provide clarity and insights that you wouldn't have had before. Chapter four talks about everyday math. If you want to grow in your mathematical life, well then find a hobby, Sudoku, cooking, fixing machines, etc. You'll find that you bump into mathematics every time. A beauty, one of the beauties of math is that you can fail so many times before finding the answers. And the only thing that you lose is really time. One technique in math is to isolate one part of a large problem, solve that and repeat it before putting everything back together again. Now, if you watch the masterclass, and I hope you do, you will find that he has some fantastic stories detailing this out. In fact, some are actually quite funny. But he asked an interesting question. Is mathematics a creative subject? T says yes, but outside the walls of a school, but in an abstract research sense, mathematics can be a creative endeavor. He goes on to talk about Johannes Kepler and what a local maximum is, and I'll leave that to him to explain it. Um, the visuals that the masterclass team puts together are fascinating. But what are components of mathematical thinking? That, that's the whole purpose of this class, growing and thinking more logically and more mathematically. Well, number one is experimentation. A willingness to fail is number two. Number three is proactive deconstruction. And then number four is remembering that sometimes you just need to zoom out, abstract the problem, create a plan of action before you make a decision. Now for chapter five, I'll skip it. It's probably the most interesting chapter, but you go watch that. Chapter six talks about solving math with a story. Now T said that he used to think math is impersonal and just equations without context. But he learned later in his career that narratives are important. They can be a protagonist, they can be an antagonist, they can be a stumbling block, uh, an obstacle, and they could be a goal. Good stories come from dumb questions. He encourages us to always ask questions. One thing I've learned is that you can ask a dumb question and that's perfectly fine. If it's a stupid question, that's okay. But you should only ask it once. If you get a good explanation the first time, you shouldn't have to ask it again. You take notes, you learn, and you move on. And you ask the next stupid question. But that's how you learn. Terence mentioned that negative numbers are not typically intuitive to people. And I can, I can understand this because growing up when I learned about negative numbers in, in primary school, I was like, what? <laughs> Why? It should be zero and then forward. Why do we have negative numbers? What does it mean? Well, let's use a story to talk about it, about negative numbers. If you work in a restaurant and you make $5 an hour, you know what happens if you work two hours, you get $10. Imagine if you were running water in that restaurant and every hour that water runs continuously is $5. And you run that water for four hours. It would cost you $20 so that you've lost $20. So that's minus 20. Now, how can we interpret minus five times minus four? We have to push the story a little bit further. Imagine that you saved water by shutting off the tap for four hours. That's minus five, which would have cost it, it would have cost you $5 an hour for four hours, minus four. If you multiply that, you would have saved $20. Minus five times minus four is plus 20. That means you've saved $20. Sometimes when it comes to math, when you create good guys, bad guys, and you turn the math problem into more of a detective mystery, it can help put you into a mindset that allows you to start looking for clues 
and helps you get into the idea and concept of process of elimination. You can activate certain aspects of your brain that gets you into this detective mode. One thing he reminds us, one thing that T reminds us to do is to be careful with the narrative because narratives can lead you astray. So you always have to make sure that you understand the key word, which is context. Context is key. In fact, I would say context is critical. Chapter seven is transforming the problem. See, the human brain has different modes. You have the visual, the musical. You can, get even, you can even get into the attack mode, in the defense mode. But transformation is a way of swapping that thought pattern. Many people gesture, and I do that a lot when I talk, but a lot of people gesture when they start analyzing a problem. Some people, you know, are using a pen and paper, then they leave and they go for a walk because that switches the thinking to a different mode. Sometimes talking about a problem to another person, even if that person is not a mathematician or a stakeholder in the problem, can help you find an answer or at least get closer to the answer. And Terrence told a funny story about how he was caught rolling on the floor with his eyes closed because he was using it to help himself solve a complex geometrical problem. Chapter eight is about games and puzzles. He talked about how you can tweak problems, even play with the hypothesis a little bit so that you can at least get started in solving the problem. He even talked about the concept of a spherical cow, assuming a spherical cow, and, and a lot more. So I advise you to check out that chapter. Chapter nine talks about math failures, math fails. And the first lesson there is don't be afraid to fail. An expert is one who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a narrow field. Failure is usually what provides the clues to a correct answer. That the most exciting sentence in science is not Eureka. Instead, it's, huh, that's funny. It means that a clue has been found and something new and exciting is going on. When you figure out what does not work, Terence encourages us to find out why. I encourage you to find out why. Finally, he mentions that you should stay patient. And sometimes the process is more crucial than finding the answer. Chapter 10 is titled Stumped. We all get stumped with problems, and it could be a math problem, it could be a life problem, it could be a big problem, it could be a small problem. Tap into all the resources that you have that are at your disposal if you're stuck. We have the internet, we have friends, we have mentors, we have parents, we have pastors, we have people around us that can assist us. Tap into those resources. And if you do not have roadblocks, then you are not challenging yourself. He mentions that experience trumps energy. And finally, sometimes just go for a walk, give things time, meditate, pray, and return to the issue with fresh eyes and a renewed mind. It could help you see something that you didn't see there before. Chapter 11, Terence was telling us how he enjoyed and learned more in mathematics after his formal education was done than during it. This was most likely because he worked with others. So learn to work with other people. T discussed how working with people who use different mathematical tools helped him because he had his own way of calculating things and his colleagues had different ways of calculating things. And all they did was join forces and they could start seeing how there were strengths and weaknesses in their various approaches. Mathematics used to be an isolated sports, but these days it's more social. We have Reddit, we have Discord, we have collaboration tools that can allow us to collaborate with people halfway across the world. One good collaboration, um, a good collaboration according to T is that it should involve one pessimist and one optimist. I have a friend who I would call him a pessimist. Whenever I have a huge problem, I call him because he will see the things that are roadblocks. And that helps me because I tend to be more optimistic. So he calls out the problems and I see the potential. Chapter 12 is titled Onward. I love the title, Upwards, Onward. Math is the most cumulative subject in human history. It's a wonderful story of discovery of the created universe. We are using math developed from thousands of years ago. We are standing on the shoulders of giants, as T said. So some insights and breakthroughs have occurred before their time and as time move forward, as time proceeds, as time trucks forward, sometimes we reach back and use those breakthroughs that happened before their time. Some solutions do not require a sledgehammer. In high school, well, in secondary school, my, my math teacher used to say, 
you shouldn't use a gun to kill a mosquito. And it was always funny to all of us. But really, T mentions this. He says, some solutions do not require a sledgehammer, which could be used to crack a walnut. Instead of using the sledgehammer to crack a walnut, and that could work, right? You could just put that walnut in a glass of water. The shell becomes so soft that it simply peels away. And my math teacher, although he was talking about math equations, and T is talking about uh, math equations and, math, math, and mathematical thinking, really, this is applied to anything in life. You need to look at the solution that you are applying to a problem and verify that that solution is worth the energy. Is that solution the right solution? Or is there a better one? One that requires less energy, one that is sustainable. So before I mention the last thing that T teaches us, I just wanna say two things. The first is thank you. Thank you very much for taking your time, taking the time out of your day to listen to me. And the second is that I hope that this episode inspires you to take action, to tackle your problems a little bit more rationally with a little bit more logic, with a little bit more courage, and hopefully with some fun, optimism, and a persistent attitude. Now let's go back to the final thing that T teaches us. He said, math is not just about solving problems. It's about discovering phenomena that have been happening for thousands of years. It's about finding out connections. And you could be part of that story. Bring your contributions, and perhaps you could help move that story forward and onward.